All right, I'm Dave Ratt, and this is the first of three videos I'm doing about the ElectroVoice RE20, my least favorite mic to work on. I've got several of them here. I'm gonna test it, pick one out, and tear it down, then fix it and rebuild it back to fully working if all goes well. In this first video, we'll talk about the RE20 and why it's a cool mic and proximity effect and all that. I got four of them sitting here and we're gonna take a look at what's wrong with these mics. Hopefully get some, one or more of these working. The RE20s and PL20s are really interesting microphones. What they've done, and it's involved with the RE15 and RE16 ElectroVoice mics as well. I've got one of the old predecessors, the ElectroVoice 666, where they started to develop this method of reducing the amount of proximity effect. So you're able to get very close to the mic and farther from the mic without having it get really boomy. You'll see that there's uh, vents in the sides and then there's a vent here and then there's another vent all the way at the bottom. So there's three different distance venting ports for the back of the mic. I'm gonna back up a little bit and talk about the way that a microphone creates its polar pattern. It's not done the same on all mics. It's not just like they can make a mic that picks up in front and rejects sound behind. It's a really complex balancing of many factors. One of the ways that they have directional aspects or implement directional aspects to mic comes naturally. The ultra high frequencies will generally pick up in front of the mic and be reduced behind because high frequencies are very short wavelengths and the size of the diaphragm, the size of the mechanical distances involved means that the high frequencies have phase issues coming from behind. So the ultra high frequencies are naturally directional. You can make it less directional by having a very, very small end to the mic like we see on analyzer mics and measurement mics. That's why they've got a very small head, so they're more omni. The next thing that happens is they'll put a drill a hole or put a port or some sort of venting behind the capsule such that some of the sound comes in front and some of the sound goes around the back and it travels a longer distance to come in the back and that sound traveling a longer distance introduces a phase issue. From the backside, it travels about the same distance. It goes in the back and it goes in the front and that creates a null so you don't get any sound. From the front, these ports are designed so that the sound in the front goes directly in, the sound coming in the back has to travel a longer distance and since they can't directly hit the diaphragm at the same time, you have addition here and from the back you get cancellation. Because of the way cardioid mics achieve their cardioid, supercardioid, hypercardioid pattern, by letting sound into the back of the diaphragm at differing distances, they create what's called proximity effect. Proximity effect is really interesting. And manufacturers have gone to great lengths to try and reduce the amount of bass boost that you get when you're really close to a directional microphone. Now, I think this is a bit confusing, and from what I've heard and how it's been explained, it gives the impression that creating a directional mic, making a mic cancel sounds coming from the rear, adds a bass boost when you're close. And I don't believe that to be correct. I believe what happens is that an Omni mic designed to be flat is has a certain frequency response. It does not vary drastically as you get farther or closer to the mic. A directional mic, by putting the opening in the back to pick up sound from the rear, actually reduces the amount of low end that it reproduces. And if you're really close to it, you can get close enough to where that reduction is minimized. As you move farther away, that directional aspect is impacting the front as well because you're more equidistant. For example, that inverse square law says when you're really close to the front of the diaphragm and the sound travels farther to get to the back, the sound traveling farther is hitting the back at a lower volume, therefore not canceling out 
as much and you get this boost. As you move farther away, that small distance of that port becomes insignificant versus the distance to the source. So here, maybe a half an inch away with an inch of travel to get to the port, you're one third the distance or it's traveling three times the distance to go to the back. When you're far away at 24 inches, the difference of that extra inch is minimal and it's not going to make much difference. So it's hitting them front and back about the same time, which is why you get the cancellation of low frequencies. Low frequencies are typically what is allowed into those ports from behind and they've got, you know, packing and filtering through some sort of damping material. The thing that always bothered me about that explanation is what about an Omni mic? If you have an Omni mic and you're really close and the Omni mic is sealed behind the capsule, then all of the sound hits the front and none of it hits the back. Therefore, the boost should be the most. And that's not the case. The Omni mic's pretty similar. It's not just the inverse square law that results in this proximity effect. It has to do with the ports are filtered, they don't let in high frequencies, and the mics are built extra bassy, such that when you're a few inches off, they have the correct amount of low end. When you get closer, they're actually built to be extra bassy so that when you're at the working distance, they sound correct. And proximity effect is when you're entering that extra bassy area closer than it's designed to operate or moving farther back farther than it's designed to operate. And when it's in its optimum area, the design of the mic with the porting and the rear and the damping of those ports keeps it at its somewhat flat response. Ideally, what they do with the RE20 and what they started to do with this 666 is to create a microphone that was somewhat immune to that bassy sound that you get up close and thinner as you get far away. Cardioid, supercardioid, hypercardioid microphones actually have an optimum distance where they have a flat response, where if you're at that distance, they should have a flat response or a response curve that you can see. If you get closer, it'll raise the low end up, and if you get farther, it lowers the low end down. You can change the response by altering the distance on most directional microphones. First, let's test them. See if we get sound out of any of them. All right, here's sound. Hey, 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 two, two, two. And it works, but it doesn't sound that great. We got a little bit of a Moroccan rattle there. So we'll set that over here. Let's check that first one again. Make sure it didn't... Oh yeah, this one worked. All right, same kind of thing. We got a rattle. We got dead. And... Hey, hey, hey. And we have a mic that works. Hey, hey, hey. But it sounds thin. I've got the high boosted here, but um, this isn't sounding great to me. Hey, hey, hey. Two, two, two. Two, yep, all right. Dead, thin, rattle, rattle. All right, in the next video, I'm gonna figure out what's wrong with this mic, tear it down, and fix the issue. And we're gonna get to look at the inside of the microphone, and we're gonna go deep.